I'm going to uh, deal with that first before we jump right in uh, to the book of Acts chapter 2 where we left off. L last week we had a very interesting Bible study. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> and um, if, you, if you weren't here last week, you may want to get the tape. You may want to find out how to get this thing online because the truth of the matter is it was one of the more most interesting Bible studies we ever had. And it was during that Bible study that I shared with you some new revelation knowledge that I had received about uh, the birth of Jesus. And um, uh, most Bible scholars uh, have always said over the years that they knew that Jesus was not born actually on December 25th. And, and, and largely they based that on the fact that it said the shepherds were tending their flock at night. And it's pretty well known that they would be tending their flock at night in the wintertime. But uh, that didn't help me or a lot of other people know exactly when he was born. And so last week, um, uh, I talked about a couple of biblical uh, suppositions as to when he was born, and I, I think that they are right, uh, that he was born in the fall. And the reason for that, again, you have to get uh, a tape or, or look at it online. I don't want to go through all of it again, but the bottom line is uh, everything in terms of God's prophetical program when I say prophetical program, it means how God is going to wrap up time, how God is going to move his plan of, of, uh, of moving through time and making his will known and done through time. Everything, major thing that relates to that seems to relate to uh, the Jewish feast. And I got a wind of this years ago when I started studying the Jewish feasts, particularly the ones in, in Leviticus chapter 23. And um, when you study it, you it just, it just by the Spirit, it jumps out at you. And um, there are more than seven, but there's seven that the Lord has pointed out to me that really explain pretty much all of the main transitions of God's uh, biblical periods or uh, divine uh, sequences in time. And the first four all happen in the spring, and the last three happen in the fall. Now the first four have already occurred. You know, the, the first one being Passover. And uh, that was on a Friday in the, in the spring. The second one being unleavened bread. That's Unleavened bread really starts the day after Passover and goes for a week. So you've got Passover on Friday, unleavened bread on a Saturday. And then you have a feast called First Fruits, which is that Sunday. Now you notice how all of this relates to Jesus, right? Jesus died on a Friday, and he was, he was buried on a Saturday, or he was in the tomb all day Saturday. And then he was the First Fruits on Sunday. And then 50 days after that, what happens? You have what we call Pentecost, or what the Jews call the Feast of Weeks, which, which was the first harvest. And so all of those things, now you know what happened on Pentecost, that's what we're studying right now, that's when the Holy Spirit came. So those are four feasts that explain all these main transitions in the kingdom, kingdom transitions, and the next three are in the fall, and they speak of um, Christ's return and then the gathering of all the saints. And so uh, when I was praying to God and asking him for illumination about when Christ was born, he basically spoke and said, the answer is, look at the feast. And so as I started looking at the feast, I started researching what a lot of other Bible scholars had said, it just all lined up. So how does that relate to the homework assignment? It relates to the homework assignment in this way. Two of the big um, scholarly and theological theories as to Jesus being born on September 11. One of them had to do with relating uh, Mary's birth to Elizabeth's birth. We know that Mary was pregnant when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, right? So that's one way we can figure out when he was born. The other one had to do with uh, uh, a verse of scripture in Revelation chapter 12 
where it talks about the dragon, it talks about the woman, and it talks about the child, and we know that to be Satan, Mary, and Jesus. And it talks about the sun and the moon, uh, the sun on her uh, midsection and the moon underneath her feet. And basically, what the theologians say there is it had to do with a time where the sun and the moon were both perfectly within the constellation of, of Virgo. And Virgo being the sign of a virgin, Mary being the sign of Mary being that virgin. And there was only one day in that time when the sun and the moon were in that constellation. So that all of this lines up. That, that And then, here's the interesting part. That particular day happens to also be the, the, the day of trumpets or the first day of the seventh month, which is Tishri, which is that fifth feast. You see what I'm saying? So once again, what God had told me uh, from spirit to spirit, it lines up. So then we got to this conversation about astrology versus astronomy. Y'all remember that? Yes. And uh, did anybody do any of the research on that? Okay, Brother Cap, I know he had some things he wanted to say about it. Uh, what, what, uh, let, here's, I'm going to ask some questions so we don't get too far afield and then we can stay on the, we can get back to Acts chapter 2. But here's the question. Can, Brother Cap, since you did some research, can you tell me what is the difference between astronomy and astrology? What did you find out to be the difference between astronomy and astrology? Are they the same thing? They're not the, they are and they aren't. Astronomy has to deal with the universe and all the planetary systems and everything and, and the physical aspects of it and the matters that they're made of. And astronomy is based on observation and research, whereas astrology just deals with the, the planets and how they align and the effect that the universe has on the planets and on, on the Earth. And when the, uh, I came up with one of the basic differences were uh, astronomy is a science that studies everything outside the Earth's atmosphere. Astronomy is based their studies on research and observation. Astrology, on the other hand, is the belief that the positioning of the stars and the planets affect the ways the way events occur on Earth. Okay, so let me recap that. Astronomy, so I say astronomy. Astronomy. Versus astrology. Versus astrology. Astronomy, based on um, science and people who are very uh, scientifically minded, astronomy is a verifiable and worldwide accepted science. Astronomy. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, it can, it's, it's, precepts and its suppositions can be factually verified. Okay? It is a science. And astrology, um, although it has been around uh, thousands of years before Christ, astrology has been seemingly always been around because man has always been fascinated with the stars. And he has been able to see certain constellations. And he saw shapes in these constellations. And he began to make certain suppositions about whether or not uh, those stars and constellations affected either world events or people and, and their personalities and characteristics. So astronomy is an accepted science that is supported by factual evidence, whereas astrology, uh, at least particularly in the last few centuries, has been tested by science and not proven to be uh, supportable by empirical evidence, okay? Now, now, again, the main difference is astronomy is the study of, as you said, the planets and the objects and the stars in the outer space. But astrology takes it further and says we're using the study of them to, it's what the, what the scientists call predictive, to predict events or to predict uh, uh, 
the personalities of people, those kinds of things. So they're making certain conclusions based upon the stars. And so, so the, the bottom line is, what we were talking about last week is the fact that we know that God has created everything. Amen? Amen. He's created all the stars. Amen. Obviously, even the scientists, even the astronomers, recognize that there are constellations. Mm -hmm. And they do agree about the shapes of those constellations. The difference, again, between astronomy and astrology is astrology then takes a leap and says, see those stars, if you were born, you know, at a certain time, then you are a certain sign, and that has a determination on your personality, and depending upon how deep you go in, it, they, can, they can talk about whether or not they can predict certain events. Here's the big point, because we're not going to have a whole session on astrology and astronomy, but here's the big point. God made all of these things. Uh, he can use anything he want, wants to for his purpose. But the biggest thing that we have to know, even though there may be some personality traits that we might see, even the astrologers, when they look at these 12 signs and they say, here are some personality traits, and they always break down into strengths and weaknesses, you know, the bottom line is when we are born again, we have the ability, we're born of the what? Spirit. Spirit. And we have the ability to be led by the Spirit. Spirit. And that's the key thing. But there's two things that happen when we're born again. One, we have the ability to be led by the Spirit. And two, we have the ability to have our mind renewed by the Word and the Spirit. Both. So, so uh, even if there are some characteristics that sometimes you may see if you study it, and you, you know, they have all the, they have these 12 signs and they have these 12 days. But the truth of the matter is, God, if, if you belong to God, and you're born of His Spirit, and, and led by His Spirit, then your personality, as long as you are walking in the Spirit, should be, you know, as they would say, the sign of the fish, which, be, which would be Christ. It would be to be Christ-like. When you are walking according to the Word, and walking according to the Spirit, what are you going to be? You're going to be like Christ. Amen? Amen. So, so that's the thing. And I think that what happens is there's a, there's a danger in astrology uh, for a lot of reasons. First of all, it goes back, like we said, to, to some would say 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years before Christ. In the most uh, elementary of civilizations, the Sumerian civilization, the Egyptian civilization, Babylonian civilization. And at that time, they were not as sophisticated scientifically as people were later. Because when the Renaissance period came, the 16th, 15th, 16th, 17th century, that's when man became, they call it the Enlightenment period. That's when man became more enlightened about science. Mm -hmm. You remember that there was a time when man thought, uh, when man thought that the earth was the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? And when Copernicus came and said, that's not right, they wanted to, you know, burn him at the stake. You know, they wanted to stone him. See, so, just because something people thought a certain way for a long time, it didn't mean that it was right. And, and they were looking at the stars, they were looking at the universe, but they were looking at it in a wrong way. So, what science has done is it said, look, you know, we're not going to believe anything unless we can prove it empirically. Now, that's good in terms of astronomy versus astrology, but then it becomes a challenge when we have to witness to some of these astronomers and scientifically minded people because then they don't want to believe anything they can't physically prove. In other words, they don't have any faith in God. But you know, that's really where, and that's another class, that's really where apologetics comes in because even the scientist who needs data, we have to be able to relate to them and show them some data. We have to be able to show them some factual things that they can understand. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, 
I was looking at some research and um, 